Welcome to CCS Talks, the second in our global series of webinars and virtual panels that the Global CCS Institute will be hosting over the coming months on key topics relevant to the development and the deployment of Carbon Capture and Storage, or CCS. My name is Lucy Temple-Smith and I'm a Senior Advisor at the Global CCS Institute based in Melbourne. The Global CCS Institute is an international think tank. Our mission is to accelerate the deployment of CCS, a vital technology to tackle climate change and deliver climate neutrality. We are located in six countries around the world and are backed by governments, companies and NGOs. Today's CCS Talks is all about the geological storage of carbon dioxide. Firstly, for those who may not be familiar with CCS, uh, it's a vital suite of climate change mitigation technologies that prevents carbon dioxide from being released to the atmosphere. CCS involves capturing CO2 produced by large industrial plants such as steel mills, cement plants, coal, natural gas, fired power plants, also refineries, um, compressing it for transportation and then injecting it deep underground into carefully selected and safe geological storage sites where it's permanently stored through being trapped in porous rock. So today's webinar, we will be focusing on the final part of the CCS process, the storage of CO2. Our presenters, who I'll introduce shortly, will provide an overview of why CO2 storage is essential in meeting global climate change targets, provide a detailed overview of the technology and how it works to permanently store emissions. We will then proceed to address a range of common myths, misconceptions and concerns about the technology, from leakage of the CO2 to responsibility for the ongoing monitoring of storage sites. And we hope that following today's presentation and discussion, you'll have a clear understanding of how CO2 storage works and that it is a well understood permanent and safe technology. So to introduce our presenters today, um, we have the Institute's Senior Consultant Storage, Dr. Chris Consoli, and our Senior Consultant Legal and Regulatory, Mr. Ian Havercroft. Between them, Ian and Chris have over 25 years of experience in CCS. Chris, a Senior Consultant working internationally in the low carbon energy industry with technical expertise in the geological storage of CO2, has focused his profession on CCS development and deployment. Chris has led multidisciplinary teams to assess CO2 storage prospects and has worked on the full breadth of storage assessments. He has expertise in climate change, energy systems, in the oil and gas industry. Chris is also an experienced geomodeler and sedimentologist with a background in paleontology. I'd also like to welcome Ian Havercroft. Ian leads the Institute's work on all legal and regulatory matters, including the delivery of technical reports and policy analysis focusing on carbon capture and storage within the future energy technologies and climate change scenarios. Ian has over 10 years international experience working on CCS, legal and regulatory matters, and has acted as an expert reviewer or an advisor to several organisations, including the International Energy Agency, and the IEA Greenhouse Gas R&D program. So just um, to let everyone know, we will be collecting questions during the presentation. Please use the, um, the you can submit your questions by please using the GoToWebinar control panel just within the, um, within the list on your screen. And I'll pose these questions to Chris and Ian after the presentation. If we, we most likely won't get to all the questions, so please do continue to pose questions as we will create some content based on these following the webinar. And just to remind everyone, the presentation that will be given today will be available following the webinar. These slides will be emailed to everyone who has attended today. Before we hear the detail of how CC CO2 storage works, I'd like to firstly introduce Ian to provide an overview about how CO2 storage and CCS more broadly contributes to achieving global climate change targets. So thanks, Ian. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, hello to everybody who's uh, listening in. Um, as Lucy suggested, I'm just going to provide a couple of slides of context to today's session. 
uh, and the role of CCS in meeting uh, the climate change targets. I'm going to uh, start by uh, stressing one of the Institute's main points, which is CCS technology is commercially available today, and it delivers the large-scale emissions abatement to meet global climate goals. Uh, CCS is a vital technology if we're to meet global climate targets and reduce emissions to net zero by mid-century. Uh, recent analysis from both the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the International Energy Agency have consistently demonstrated CCS is part of the lowest cost path towards meeting climate targets. In addition, we have decades of oil and gas industry expertise, um, data from storage site monitoring, measurement and verification, which Chris will talk about later, and numerous academic studies, which would also confirm uh, the technology's role. CCS technologies are proven, uh, including storage, and they've been in commercial operation since the 1970s. And to date, uh, over 260 million tons of CO2 have been captured. Also significant is the fact that technologies are CCS technologies are versatile. Uh, they importantly avoid CO2 emissions at point source, as well as decrease the stock of CO2 emissions already in the atmosphere. All of the proposed models uh, that I just mentioned previously require substantial volumes of CO2 to be captured, transported and stored in order to meet our climate change targets. The role um, of CO2 storage in this discussion uh, is also uh, a vital one. It is important to note that geological storage achieves gigaton emissions reductions, reductions but if we're to achieve climate change targets, multi-gigaton levels of storage will be necessary. In fact, the IEA forecasts that 2.3 gigatons of CO2 must be stored each year by 2060. To meet uh, climate targets, the IPCC climate pathways model up to uh, 1,200 gigatons of CO2 cumulatively stored by 2100. In sum, this means we will need a CCS deployment rate of more than double to that growth of the oil industry during the last century. Thanks, Ian. Um, I think that really sets the scene for why CCS is so critical for meeting climate change targets. So thanks for those insights. Um, I would like to now introduce Chris, who's going to take us through the detail of how geological storage of CO2 actually works. So Chris, what exactly is CO2 storage? How does it work? Hi, Lucy, and thanks very much. And thanks everyone from around the world uh, for dialing in. Uh, so as Lucy mentioned, uh, I'm gonna cover what is CO2 storage. Uh, as uh, Lucy said at the start of the presentation, CO2 storage is the final step in the CCS chain. So ultimately it's isolating the CO2 permanently from the atmosphere uh, to avoid climate change. The fundamentals of what makes a suitable, safe and permanent site for storing CO2 is well known. Uh, we need to find three key elements, which you can see in the slide in front of you. The first one is a greater depth, uh, a depth greater than one kilometer. Now the primary reason for this depth, uh, for this depth which can vary between 600 and greater than 1000 meters is not where there is suitable geology available, rather it is the behavior of the CO2 itself. So when CO2 is stored uh, in the rocks below this depth, the natural pressure and temperature of the earth compresses the CO2 to what we call a dense phase. Now in this dense phase, uh, you can store significantly more CO2 than what you could at say the surface uh, with the same amount. Uh, also, the movement of the CO2 uh, is lower, making containment easier. Now the second containment you need uh, for is, is a suitable location. And what that is, is a place where you can store the CO2 deep in the subsurface. The CO2 must be contained within a reservoir and most commonly, uh, it contained underneath the reservoir by a cap rock. Now I'll explain exactly what those two elements are uh, in the next couple of slides. The third element uh, is perhaps one of the most important but overlooked areas and that, me that is that there needs to be sufficient space to host and then permanently contain all the CO2 stored or required to be stored. 
And the reason why it's overlooked is because we often search for huge reservoirs, hundreds or thousands of times larger than is actually ever required for a CCS project. In the next slide, uh, the three main targets which we are targeting, um, I'll, I'll discuss it uh, briefly. So there's three, uh, but we're not limited to these three. There is a uh, abundance of other uh, more niche storage sites, but generally the CCS industry focus on these three. Saline form formations are the first ones. These are large reservoirs with containment mechanisms, typically a caprock uh, that right now, today, hosts saline water, but we hope to replace that saline water with CO2. These are far, by far the most common uh, and largest target for the CCS industry. The second target which we aim for is CO2 uh, enhanced oil recovery or CO2 EOR. Uh, these are fields with existing oil in place which when the CO2 is injected enables more oil to be produced and I'll touch on that briefly uh, in the slide in a couple of slides. The third target is depleted oil and gas fields. Uh, these old hydrocarbon fields once hosted gas and oil but have since become exhausted. Uh, these are strong candidates for CO2 storage, however, because we know that they can hold a, a, a fluid, a gas or an oil, uh, meaning that there is containment. And we know they've hosted the gas and oil because we produce from it, so it has a reservoir. A critical aspect of depleted oil and gas reservoirs is that there is a strong amount of knowledge gathered during the production of oil or gas in the form of subsurface wells and seismic as well as production data uh, while they're working the site. So this en enables us to move in quickly um, and rapidly characterize the site for its suitability for CO2 storage. On to the next slide where it's uh, very aptly named storage rocks, uh, because this is the critical part of understanding CO2 storage. And it's actually a common myth. Uh, which is in, is in the name. CO2 is not stored in natural caverns or in underground bunkers, it's stored in rocks. Two types of rocks, uh, reservoirs and cap rocks, but they're still rocks. Uh, the example I'm showing here is exactly the kind of rocks we're targeting, but that kilometers, uh, that one kilometer or greater underground. And this is a picture from the Grand Canyon. But just like in the Grand Canyon, these reservoir cap rock pairs are common and often stacked. So we see multiple uh, reservoir and, and cap rocks uh, joined together. And from this image, you can see uh, we've got yellow and blue being the reservoirs and brown being the cap rocks. So as I said, CO2 is stored in a rock. The two common, common reservoirs we target are sandstones and carbonates like limestones. And that rock, despite being solid, is porous and it has holes uh, or pores, we like to call them. And these are the little holes between the grains of sand that enable the CO2 to be held in the rock. Today, it hosts water, or oil or gas, uh, all naturally occurring CO2. Now that rock is also permeable, meaning these pores are connected. And it also means that the CO2 can flow through the rock, enabling us to use all of that rock uh, to store the CO2. And that is, that is very critical to enabling CCS to be at scale. The second uh, storage uh, rock that we aim for is the cap rock overlying the reservoir. Now this rock is typically a mudstone and it's not permeable. So fluids, including CO2, cannot flow easily through the rock. And that means the CO2 is trapped permanently. You can see from the four schematics below, uh, previous slide, sorry. Uh, there's three, four phases of storage. Uh, the free phase is the one that I just discussed. So the CO2 moves to the cap rock and gets trapped. The second one along is residual trapping, and that is the little uh, molecules of CO2 get trapped beneath those, between those pores uh, of the sand. And when that happens, the, the, they start to dissolve in the, in the saline water and become something like a salty soda water. Eventually the CO2 reacts with the surrounding rocks and the fluids and they mineralize. Uh, and that's the final step in the fundamentals of CO2 storage. 
A second fundamental misconception, misconception for CO2 storage uh, is we don't know how to do it. Uh, it's new or novel. Well, CO2 has been injected for enhanced oil recovery for over 40 years. And in the North Sea of Norway, CO2 has been injected solely for the purpose of emission reduction for 20 years. Uh, that is the project uh, you can see in the middle of that slide called Sleipner underneath the Norwegian flag. Now this schematic that you can see is a snapshot of a wide variety of countries, environments and geology that CCS has been actively storing into. From 2000 meters uh, of water off the coast of Brazil on the left hand side uh, using large floating platforms. Uh, we have the Tomokamai project in Japan in the center of that image. They're taking CO2 from a hydrogen plant, injecting it onshore and then storing it offshore uh, in a very thin but large reservoir. And that shows the kind of engineering that can be overcome to enable CCS. The final project, uh, the one with the Australian flag, the Gorgon CO2 injection facility, uh, which when fully operational will be storing between three and four million tonnes of CO2 per year, uh, the world's largest CCS project. And it will reduce the carbon footprint of the Gorgon facility uh, by up to 40% when fully operational. My final slide uh, addresses an area of significant uh, misconception, enhanced oil recovery using CO2. Uh, it's also a critical area to discuss because it has um, important implications for the permanence of CO2 and lessons learned for the CCS industry. So today, to date, over 260 million tonnes of anthropogenic CO2 has been injected and permanently stored through enhanced oil recovery, mostly. What I say mostly is because we are starting to see more projects coming online for emissions reduction. But the majority of that 260 million tonnes of human CO2 uh, has been injected for enhanced oil recovery. Now, increasing oil production this way using CO2 is a standard mature and routine global operation. Uh, it's given us the confidence in the technology and the experience, which is very important, to enable us to say that CCS can happen at scale and can have a significant impact on reducing global emissions on an industrial scale. Now, the process behind CO2 EOR is relatively simple. You inject the CO2 into an oil field, and then the properties of CO2 make the oil more mobile and less viscous. And with the pressure of the CO2, helps the, CO, helps the oil and the CO2 uh, be produced. And you can see it's starting to produce a loop. Now, a proportion of that CO2 as it's migrating uh, through the oil field becomes trapped by those processes I mentioned previously, uh, tr free phase trapping, residual trapping uh, and dissolution. And it's never produced again and permanently stored. Around a third and up to a half can be permanently stored this way. For some of the CO2, uh, along with a mixture of brine and oil and other fluids, it's produced, but that CO2 is then separated and re-injected, <clears throat> and it creates, a, it creates a closed loop. So it's important to note that in the majority of CO2 EO operations, CO2 is a very expensive part of the operational cost. So every molecule supplied is re-injected. And that high cost also means that the gas is monitored at the surface and within the reservoir to ensure that it's being used optim uh, optimally. And this has given us a, a real wealth in knowledge uh, and a whole wealth of technologies available to understand and track the movement of CO2. Ultimately, all the CO2 injected into an oil field remains trapped in the pore space uh, that originally held the oil and other fluids. Uh, finally, the IEA estimates that the permanent storage of CO2 through enhanced oil recovery delivers emissions abatement on a full life cycle, cycle basis, uh, including the emissions from the, from the oil being produced. And we are likely to see in the near future, uh, these sites being negative emissions uh, locations. Uh, so there's a wealth of information and optimism, um, despite uh, them being part of oil fields. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for that fantastic detailed explanation of how storage works.
And now we've had that and we've got an understanding of how the process actually works. I'd like to now bring the discussion back to the role of CO2 storage specifically in meeting climate targets and what needs to happen for this technology to play its vital part in reducing emissions. So Ian, if I could loop back to you on this to provide some further thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. I mean, it's clear from our last few slides that we've highlighted essentially the rationale for undertaking CO2 storage. But it is clear um, through the work that the Institute has done and undertaken in recent years that we need to scale up CO2 storage. Um, unfortunately, the deployment of CCS is not happening quickly enough for it to play its role in meeting the emissions targets that I highlighted in my earlier slides. Uh, if CCS is to play its part, we're going to need substantial scale up uh, of CO2 storage. Uh, the IEA greenhouse gas uh, program suggests that 30 to 60 sites are required each year until uh, 2050. Um, this means we will need to see a significant ramp up of both infrastructure build out rates and the development of storage sites. There, uh, there is, however, some very positive news. Um, this scale up can be achieved uh, where there is both supportive policy and a business case for CCS. The significance of the technology in achieving emissions reductions um, is now uh, more regularly being acknowledged by, uh, by countries around the world. And a number of countries to date have now implemented initiatives to identify CO2 storage sites. Um, two uh, specific examples, and I've mentioned them on the slide, uh, there are the United States, which has identified a series of sites capable of storing 50 million tonnes or more of CO2, uh, and another example in the form of Japan, who has recently completed an offshore uh, drilling campaign to test CO2 storage formations there. So there is positive signs of, uh, of, of what is required for the future. Thanks, Ian. Um, now, Chris has already touched on a few myths, misconceptions, or even concerns around CO2 storage. What we'd like to do in this section of the presentation today is to go a little bit further into some of the myths and misconceptions that we hear at the Institute um, and that we would like to address in the next set of slides. So some of these we hear as that Chris has already talked about, there's a bit of a misconception CO2 storage is not happening, that it is potentially an untested or unproven technology, which he will go into a little bit further. We also hear that there's not enough storage space to store enough CO2 to make a difference and to actually reduce emissions to reach climate targets. The CO2 will leak is another common misconception. And also questions around whether there is specific regulation in place for this technology and also who is responsible for the CO2 once it's been stored underground, who is responsible for the site and the monitoring of the CO2. So starting with the technology itself, um, Chris, could you begin here and talk through the common misconception that the underground storage of CO2 is untested or unproven? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Uh, the, the, my heading to that, second heading to that slide says it all, storage is happening. So as I said, and uh, everyone often says, is that over 200 million tonnes of anthropogenic CO2 has been successfully in injected underground. 40 years of knowledge across a wide range of environments. Now, now that um, dispels that, that main misconception that we always get that CO2 storage isn't happening, and even CCS more broadly because that same CO2 is being captured at an industrial facility. As I discussed above, the, the oil industry, but also the hydrogeology industry and, and other um, industries that focus on both the subsurface and the near surface, uh, all, all have worked together to understand how fluids move within the subsurface. And through that process, where we really have a good understanding of how CO2 moves through underground rock formations. Uh, how it reacts with certain rocks um, and how the plumes migrate uh, as they go through different types of rocks or under different uh, environments or properties. And we also have the necessary steps and have the technology to provide the best conditions to ensure that CO2 is permanently stored. And, and that's another important aspect um, of saying that CO2 storage 
permanently removing or isolating the CO2 from the environment is proven. And we do this through monitoring technologies, uh, which enable us to understand the movement of the CO2 pl plume. Um, World-renowned researchers are studying the natural accumulations of CO2, purposely releasing CO2 to understand its impacts on the environment uh, and refining the technologies and techniques of CO2 injection, uh, CO2 containment and CO2 plume monitoring. It gives us a real confidence that um, to say uh, CO2 storage is happening and CO2 storage is proven. On to the next slide. Uh, the second major misconception is that there's, uh, that Lucy presented at the start of this section, is that there's not enough storage space uh, for CCS to happen. So in 2005, uh, leading academics and people in the CCS industry, as, as part of the IPCC special edition, uh, unequivocally said that there was more than enough storage available to meet all the all climate targets in 2005. Now today, that message has not changed. In fact, uh, as we've explored and started to understand the movement of CO2 uh, and where CO2 can be st stored, um, we've actually blown that myth completely apart. So current theoretical estimates uh, indicate that there's about a thousand years of storage uh, resources available for CO2 from CCS for even the most ambitious climate targets. The numbers on this slide of, the, of countries around the world uh, are in billion ton, metric tons of CO2 and it's an indication of how much CO2 could be stored uh, theoretically in each of those nations. Now if you remember from Ian's presentation from the start, 1200 gigatons of CO2 cumulatively, cumulatively stored between now uh, and 2100 to avoid the worst of climate change. Now the US alone um, through the good work of the Department of Energy and the national laboratories have identified over 2,000 gigatons of storage in the US alone. Um, and that's at its most conservative level. Now, of course, all of this is not exploitable uh, and, and there's much more work to, to, to undertake to uh, reach those, those numbers that you see in front of you. But the good news is, is that we know there's no technical barriers to permanently store CO2 at the rate or scale needed to meet the most ambitious uh, climate targets. Thanks, Chris, um, especially for that detailed explanation of that common misconception. It's worth noting, I think, here that one of the biggest concerns about the storage of CO2 comes from local communities where the storage or the pipelines carrying the CO2 are, are close to. And so, in terms of that and really addressing those concerns around the movement of CO2 and the security of it for local communities. Can you speak a little bit mm. further about that? Yeah, so the monitoring technologies that we use to uh, see the plume ha have been refined from the hydrocarbon and hydrogeology industries. And it's enabled us to very accurately um, understand the movement of the CO2 plume, but also measure how much CO2 is in the brine. Uh, within the reservoir ex itself and that can be done in real time uh, as they're injecting they can measure how much co2 is saturating uh, in the in the brine we can predict very accurately where the co2 plume will move through modeling uh, and slow and understand how it will slow and where it would accumulate uh, in the local geology and importantly we can rapidly identify if something goes wrong which thankfully has only happened uh, on purpose uh, for the sake of research to date. So I mentioned monitoring um, several times uh, uh, over the course of my slides, but it, it's known within the CCS industry as, as MMV or monitoring, measurement and verification. And it really plays a vital role in, in what Lucy was talking about is local communities and assurance that CO2 is secure. Uh, but it's also critical for companies um, injecting the CO2 that is meeting their operational needs and regulatory needs, which Ian will touch on uh, next. The slide that you can see in front of you is, is just a schematic, schematic of a selection of monitoring technologies available and used today for CO2 storage. There are many, and, and this is just a snapshot. Not every CO2 storage site will require all these technologies, 
and they may all not work on a spe specific site. But it's important to note that there are many available. So we do monitor three main areas. We monitor the, the storage plume itself, and that includes the reservoir and the uh, technology, and the, sorry, the rocks immediate, immediately surrounding that reservoir and CO2 plume, including the overlying cap rock. And the idea there is to understand that the CO2 is behaving as expected. Now, the project I mentioned uh, in a previous slide uh, in the North Sea of Norway, the Sleipner project, they've been able to image using seismic uh, the CO2 plume as it moves through the reservoir for over 20 years. And importantly, they predicted where it would go and been proven right. Um, that builds a huge amount of confidence uh, in the technology itself, uh, but also for regulators and the community. But the CO2 plume in the reservoir itself isn't the only area uh, for the community. They will, the community want to know that the environment above is being monitored and uh, the CO2 is not uh, leaking into that environment. And so there's monitoring technologies available for the groundwater uh, above the site, uh, the vegetation and the soil. In fact, there's uh, really sophisticated autonomous sensors that measure the, the CO2 or the gas, I should say, uh, in the in the in the soil um, just above co2 storage sites um, there's also technologies which can measure the air or the ocean above a co2 storage site so the chance of a co2 site ever losing containment uh, to the surface is incredibly low uh, in fact it's one of the lowest potential risks identified uh, as part of risk assessment uh, but for the community uh, it's a proven it's in, critical to prove uh, and it's important to have that tool for social acceptance for CCS. Thanks, Chris. So I think that certainly demonstrates how comprehensive the monitoring around storage sites is. So that was um, a great explanation. Thank you. One of the next mis misconceptions or concerns that we come across that I mentioned at the beginning of the section was that there is insufficient regulation in place to sure that storage sites are appropriately managed, not only during the operation of them, but of course into the future. So Ian, if I could ask you to take us through an overview here of, of the frameworks in place for CCS operations and just to address some of these concerns. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, an issue that we um, are regularly uh, asked in relation to whether CCS is in fact a regulated process. And I think it's important to start out by noting the importance of law and regulation um, for CCS deployment. Uh, the engagement that we, we have regularly with policymakers and regulators, um, project proponents and, and industry stakeholders here at the Institute and around the world suggests that legal and regulatory frameworks are actually fundamental and critical to um, CCS's deployment. Over the past 10 years, we have seen the development of a number of CCS specific uh, frameworks in many jurisdictions globally. Um, these have included more piecemeal uh, pieces of legislation aimed at uh, addressing a singular issue, but they also include dedicated regulatory models. And a number of those are now in force in Australia, uh, the United States, uh, across Europe and Canada. In addition, we've also seen provisions uh, within uh, international law and at the international level which govern CO2 storage uh, in sub seabed formations. So there is quite a substantial body now of legislation governing carbon capture and storage operations. It's important to highlight, particularly when we're talking about the role of law and regulation here, to note that these models not only uh, facilitate deployment but they also aimed at ensuring high levels of environmental protection and public safety, so particularly relevant to the point that Chris just made earlier. Um, and they also extend a number of very well understood and important uh, provisions found in uh, energy legislation or environmental legislation around the world to, uh, to apply to CCS activities. Um, the early frameworks that have been developed, as I mentioned over the past few years, have proven particularly effective at clarifying uh, rights and responsibilities uh, of both um, CTS operators uh, and the authorities that are going to be responsible for regulating those activities uh, in relation to CCS. And one example here would be um, 
how storage uh, formations, um, access to storage formations may be allocated. Um, legislation has also been significant in addressing some of those novel aspects of the CCS process. Um, issues that were frequently raised in the early stages related to permanency of the CO2, how legislation would manage that, the risks associated with CO2, CO2 storage, and I'll come on to that in a minute, uh, but also um, who is responsible for the CO2 once it is injected and beyond into the future, and that is something that I'll touch upon in my next couple of slides. So one of the myths um, that we frequently dispel is that we don't know um, the risks of CO, uh, of CO2 storage, and as Chris mentioned uh, in some of his earlier presentation, that is in fact a very clear myth, and we and we do understand it. And I thought, given that the focus of today's discussion on storage, this uh, particular diagram provides a very good example of how many policymakers, uh, regulators, and uh, project proponents perceive the life cycle risk profile of a CO2 uh, storage operation. Um, as you can see from this diagram, which is which is incidentally known by many as the Benson curve, um, named after uh, Professor Sally Benson of Stanford University, who did a lot of work in this space and designed this model. Um, the environmental risks rise uh, throughout the injection phase, but reduce considerably uh, as pressure in the storage site re uh, reaches its maximum once injection stops and the site is eventually closed. Uh, and as Chris mentioned previously, you can see from this diagram in the bottom half the significant role that MMV will play in reaffirming some of the predictive modeling that goes into this. Um, it's also clear from this uh, diagram that there's going to be some, some residual risks uh, remaining following the cessation of injection, for example, or the closure of a storage site. But it is this model that's proven particularly important for both regulators and policymakers when designing their legal and regulatory frameworks and addressing topics such as monitoring, measurement, verification, and, and liability, which uh, brings me on to that topic. Um, and perhaps this is one of the more controversial uh, topics and one of the issues uh, that I received the most questions upon. Um, how um, is liability to be managed? Who is responsible, for example, for CO2 throughout the project life cycle and instances where something does not go to plan? Um, as I said, this has been a consider of considerable interest to, uh, to many around the world. Um, and indeed, how liabilities uh, are to be apportioned throughout the project life cycle has become a very critical factor in many of the CCS specific frameworks uh, that we've seen to date, notably, um, who will be responsible for any incident uh, and when they will be responsible for that incident. Um, several of these CCS specific legal and regulatory frameworks, and I use, for example, those found in Australia, for example, in, and the EU, um, careful, uh, include very explicit provisions as to how liability is to be managed. Um, and I've highlighted three specific areas in the last three bullet points. Uh, on this slide, some of the more significant aspects of these liability regimes. Um, the first you can see there is, is, is the issue of frameworks uh, that have addressed the challenge of managing liabilities across a project life cycle. Uh, and in the case of CO2 storage, long into the future where CO2 is to be stored in perpetuity. What we've seen is these regulatory frameworks adopting some somewhat novel solutions uh, to, to addressing these challenges. Uh, with the introduction of closure regimes, um, financial security payments throughout the operational phase uh, to address the issues of, of something that may occur. Um, in my penultimate point there, early uh, with regards to forms of liability, many of the early frameworks have also sought to address uh, how li or which liabilities are likely to be applicable to CCS operations. Um, it's very clear when you look at the individual regulatory models that have been uh, developed that operators will bear a number of different types of liability throughout the project life cycle. Uh, and one interesting example is, is found um, within the EU where it's clear that they'll likely incur some, for, some form of climate liability um, under the EU emissions trading scheme uh, in instances of leakage, for example. 
And then my final point there is, is, is equally significant, which is that several of the frameworks include very clear allocation uh, of roles and responsibilities, which ensure security throughout the project lifecycle. And perhaps one of the, uh, the best examples uh, is illustrated in the opportunity to transfer liability under some regimes um, at the point of uh, closure or, or in the post-closure phase from the operator to a competent authority in some jurisdictions. So as you can see, there are some very um, detailed mechanisms in place uh, to ensure that uh, liabilities are managed uh, successfully. Thanks, Anne, and um, thanks to both Chris and Anne for all of those insights today. I think we've um, we've certainly had a fantastic overview of the technology and um, had a lot of those mis misconceptions and concerns addressed there. We now have time for questions and answers. We have almost 300 people on the webinar today, so we've had some uh, an amazing amount of questions come through. Um, I'll start with a few. There's a there's one misconception, or maybe I'd say a concern that we we didn't address. Chris, this one is for you. Um, there's been a few questions around earthquakes. Mm. Do earthquakes affect um, CO2 stored underground? Uh, has an earthquake caused leakage of CO2? Things like that. So if you could maybe provide some comments on that topic. Yep. Yeah, you're right. So we do get ask that question a lot uh, and I have two very quick answers uh, for the sake of today. So in Japan there have been two CO2 storage projects. Uh, I mentioned the one of them, Tomokamai, and another one um, which had been had injected up to 10,000 uh, tonnes of CO2. Both were world-class storage sites uh, with robust and abundant monitoring but that meant um, they knew a lot about their subsurface and both uh, incredibly had been through significant earthquakes close by. In both, uh, in the in one of those projects we saw surface damage including the road to the storage site um, and then nothing in the other. The Japanese researchers and in particular Japan CCS found that despite the earthquake being very close, albeit a few kilometres deeper than where the CO2 site was, uh, the CO2 was stored, the CO2 remains in the ground. Um, they could see this. They could see the earthquake on this on their monitoring technology, uh, but the CO2 still remained um, in the ground. The second line of evidence is probably the strongest. The misconception is that when an earthquake happens, it means a large fault will strike through the CO2 plume, and then that fault will continue to make its way to the surface and open up a giant chasm, releasing all the CO2. But in reality, uh, we've got many naturally occurring CO2 fields oil and gas fields that are socially, uh, associated with seismically active zones. Now, Indonesia uh, and California are great examples. Yet, when there's earthquakes there, we don't see sudden releases of oil and gas after every earthquake. And we don't expect to see the same for CO2 injected uh, into the ground. Thanks, Lucy. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that the not only the slides but the full recording of the of the, today's presentation will be available and emailed to all attendees. Um, Chris, while I've got you and talking about uh, storage and the specifics around this, we've got a question around how long does it take for the CO2 to when it's injected to mineralize with the surrounding rocks? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. They, so there. Basically, those four processes that I showed uh, happen all at the same time. As soon as you inject the CO2, uh, a little bit's being um, moving throughout the reservoir, a little bit's being dissolved, a little bit's being trapped in the pore space, and a little bit's being mineralized. But over time, uh, each of those factors become the dominant factor. And when we're talking about mineralization, it really depends on the, the fluids uh, and the, the rock type you're injecting into. So there's an example uh, in Iceland where they're injecting into a basalt, uh, a volcanic rock, and they're getting mineralization very rapidly. Um, but uh, there's other storage sites where there is still naturally occurring CO2 after millions of years. So it's never been min mineralized. So mineralization actually isn't a critical part of storing CO2 permanently. We know from um, naturally occurring CO2 fields, 
and and our experience in CCS um, for CO2 storage uh, more generally, that residual trapping and dissolution, it can be seen as permanent trapping, permanent forms of trapping. And then of course, you've got your containment uh, of your cap rock above as well. Thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I'll have one more while you're talking about the specifics again. Um, someone has asked about, is there any chance of leakage of CO2 while the CO2 is actually going through the injection process? So I assume here we could um, think about that from, you know, the actual transport to the anything going on on the, on the um, surface as well. Yeah, of course. So carbon capture and storage, like any industrial process, is an industrial process. So there's risks um, involved in all of them. Um, the transport of natural gas or, or um, uh, anything. Um, but there's risk assessments and there's processes in place to avoid that. So I think more to the question of injecting CO2, um, they, the, the oil and gas industry have, um, have very high standards uh, for their, their operations. So very high um, risk assessments, um, very high standards of operation and very high um, regulations in place, both self-imposed and by by the um, the governments in which they're operating. And what that means is that they have a very robust um, monitoring technologies to ensure that the CO2 won't escape, but also during their drilling process, um, they ensure that there is um, um, methods and techniques to make sure that CO2 won't leak while injecting. Um, right, did that Chris. answer it fine? I, I think yes, that was um there was no further detail on that question, but um okay. thanks for that. And again we'll we'll capture any further on that. And once again we'll we've had some questions as well that ones that we will um address in terms of resources and and pointing people to uh, two different um publications that Ian and Chris you've both used. So we'll certainly for anyone asking those questions we'll have that information. For you following the webinar. Um, thanks Chris, I'll throw a few questions towards Ian now. Um, Ian, in terms of, you mentioned some countries throughout your presentation and your slides, in terms of legislation around CCS, what what countries would you say are leading that or which, which ones are, are ones you'd like to mention as, as leading? Thanks Lucy. Yes, I did um, mention um, uh, a, a short list of countries in, um, I think it was one of the early regulation slides, and I mentioned um, Australia, uh, the EU, the US, and Canada. Um, and they all provide some very uh, interesting frameworks, both at um, a, a national or indeed sub-national level. Um, within the EU, you've got a, a regional uh, piece of legislation that's applicable to all the EU member states, for example, uh, in the form of the EU Storage Directive. Um, I, I won't go into, into saying which is, uh, which is the preferred model, but they do all offer some very interesting um, ways of addressing CCS within um, their regulatory remit and scope. Um, as I mentioned, they all um, have some interesting nuances uh, in relation to addressing novel issues, uh, and they've all been, uh, I think to a large extent, very successful in, in managing uh, those, those novel issues. But um, certainly those, those sort of four or five countries and regions have been very much at the forefront of, of CCS uh, law, legal and regulatory development. Great, thanks Ian. Um, and just moving on to, there's been a few questions around liability as well. Um, in terms of transfer, could you talk a little bit further about whether I don't know whether you can say whether that's the best model. What what's um what your thoughts are, or what um is is known about about that as um in terms of being the favoured model. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question, and again, one um we I, I get quite regularly, um and I think I'm going to slightly dodge this and say I'm I'm slightly apolitical as to which which is the best approach here. Um, Transfer has been very uh, well received in some jurisdictions, certainly within the EU. Um, it was a critical um, part of the negotiation of the EU 
uh, CCS directive, for example, uh, and was hotly debated between um, uh, potential operators, project proponents, uh, and also the commission during that, that phase. Um, it's, it's a useful tool in that it allows um, uh, essentially uh, operators to limit their liabilities on into, perp into perpetuity um, for a, te uh, a technological um, uh, phase of the project, which, sorry, a, a, the storage phase of the project, which um, could obviously in perpetuity uh, leave a lot of uh, issues on their balance books. So it's very successful in that regard. Um, I will point out, however, that's not the approach adopted in some other jurisdictions around the world, and it has it hasn't necessarily precluded projects going ahead. Um, and certain jurisdictions are, are quite happy with that approach. So I think it really does just depend on the needs um, of both the regulators and operators in a specific jurisdiction. Uh, but there are some good examples of both. I hope that answers the question. Okay. In a very roundabout yeah, way. thank you. No, that, that's great. Um, and one that we might um, we might end with, I think you can both provide comments on that. Um, and we did address, Ian, you, you spoke a little bit about what needs to happen in terms of scaling up to um, CCS and, and more specifically um, what that means for storage. Can both of you comment on what you see uh, from your points of view, the, the main hurdles there, is it, is it regulatory, um, things like liability, um, are there still, well, Chris, you've, you've outlined all of the confidence around the technology and storage, but are there any areas there that you think are hampering the, the deployment of CCS? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first, Ian. Um, sure, thanks, Chris. And, and, it, and yeah, Ian and I have long discussed this, and it, there's two obvious areas around CCS. Um, we need to identify storage sites and we need the regulations in place to enable CCS and CO2 storage to happen. So we know that there's no technical barriers to the storage of CO2. We can identify sites, we can inject CO2 uh, at scale, at a commercial scale, uh, and we can um, store the CO2 um, and monitor it safely. Uh, but the critical step that is missing right now is identifying those sites around the world. So I showed that map of all the storage resources, but they're not storage sites. So that's where CO2 um, is, they've identified uh, large scale areas, which could, could store potentially CO2. Um, now we need to go as a global community and identify those specific sites, uh, which are a, a prospective, in terms of being close to an emission source and in terms of having suitable geology um, and suitable um, accessibility um, to enable CO2 storage and CCS to happen. And that accessibility um, is, is regulation. And I'll um, leave that to Ian. Thanks, Chris. Um, yes, I'd, <laughs> I'd obviously agree with you on, on all of those points. I mean, I, one of the things that um, we produce uh, within the within the Institute is the CCS Readiness Index, which Chris and I work on, um, looking at jurisdictions around the world and their readiness to undertake CCS. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear from those assessments that uh, storage, regulation, uh, policy support, uh, incentives are all absolutely fundamental to getting CCS um, deployment. Um, work has happened in many jurisdictions, and we've mentioned a few of those today, uh, but that work is not complete um, and much more needs to be done, be it in the policy space, uh, in the provision of incentives, uh, as we heard earlier through uh, further storage work, uh, and in my space specifically, in the legal and regulatory space, uh, issues such as liability, um, where there has been a considerable amount of work um, done to date. There is a very positive outlook, but there is more uh, work to be done. Um, perhaps what concerns me the most uh, is in relation to widespread uh, deployment. Um, as you, you heard from Chris earlier on, there is potential for CO2 st uh, storage operations throughout the world. Um, more worryingly, perhaps, is those jurisdictions which have yet to start um, their CCS story 
looking at um, the necessary enablers uh, for CCS, so undertaking storage assessments, their policy, um, their legal and regulatory environment. Uh, if we're to meet some of the mitigation targets that we're looking for, we're going to need to undertake that work um, sooner rather than later. I'll leave it there, I think. Fantastic. Thank you both. And we'll wrap up the questions part of today's webinar there. Thanks both, Chris and Ian. So I'd just like to, in conclusion, to wrap up just a few of the key points. I think today we've um, we've certainly heard that CO2 storage is and proven that CO2 storage is well understood. It's a proven technology, and it's a safe technology that leads to permanent storage of CO2 emissions. Um, we've understood that it's vital to achieving global climate change targets, and that in fact CCS specific regulatory frameworks are in place. Um, in many places across the world, and that responsibility for CCS is a key feature of, of these frameworks. I'd just like to mention um, a few additional resources. Ian just referred to the CCS Readiness Index and Policy Incentives. These, um, these topics are covered in Global CCS Institute publications, um, as well as Ian's most recent Thought Leadership Report on CSCS Liability, so I recommend our resource library for downloading those reports. Also like to mention in general a, the global status of CCS report, our latest report published late last year provides all of the most up-to-date detail on the projects and deployment of CCS worldwide, um, so please download that from our website as well. And also if you'd like to delve into even Further detail around CCS, our global database CORE is available again via our website or from core.co and this details all of the information about projects, policies, storage, legal and regulatory information and even into emissions data so please check that out. Um, I'd just like to mention as well we have um, some CCS talks coming up. Um, we have a few reports coming out which the first being scaling up the CCS market to deliver net zero emissions and the second uh, um, the value of carbon capture and storage and there will be CCS talks webinars on both of those topics. The dates are there. Please register via our website and in general follow us on Twitter at Global CCS or follow the hashtag CCS talks to keep up to date with this webinar series. Any further questions from today can be directed to webinar at globalccsinstitute.com. We monitor that address and we'd love to keep hearing from you about not only today's topics, but any future topics that you would like us to cover. So finally, I'd just like to um, thank both Chris and Ian for their insights and presentations today. Thank you very much. And also to our colleague Sonia, who's um, operating the webinar from behind the scenes. Thank you very much. And finally, thanks to everyone who attended today from across the world. Um, we hope you have found this CCS Talks insightful and we look forward to welcoming you at future CCS Talks. Thanks very much. <laughs>